The Desire of Ages, Chapter 15, At the Marriage Feast Jesus did not begin his ministry by some great work before the Sanhedrin at Jerusalem. At a household gathering in a little Galilean village, his power was put forth to add to the joy of a wedding feast. Thus he showed his sympathy with men and his desire to minister to their happiness. In the wilderness of temptation, he himself had drunk the cup of woe. He came forth to give to men the cup of blessing by his benediction to hallow the relations of human life. From the Jordan, Jesus had returned to Galilee. There was to be a marriage at Canaan, a little town not far from Nazareth. The parties were relatives of Joseph and Mary, and Jesus, knowing of this family gathering, went to Cana, and with his disciples was invited to the feast. Again he met his mother, from whom he had for some time been separated. Mary had heard of the manifestation at the Jordan, at his baptism. The tidings had been carried to Nazareth, and had brought to her mind afresh the scenes that for so many years had been hidden in her heart. In common with all Israel, Mary was deeply stirred by the mission of John the Baptist. Well, she remembered the prophecy given at his birth. Now his connection with Jesus kindled her hopes anew. But tidings had reached her also of the mysterious departure of Jesus to the wilderness, and she was oppressed with troubled forebodings. From the day when she heard the angel's announcement in the home of Nazareth, Mary had treasured every evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. His sweet, unselfish life assured her that he could be no other than the scent of God. Yet there came to her also doubts and disappointments, and she had longed for the time when his glory should be revealed. Death had separated her from Joseph, who had shared her knowledge of the mystery of the birth of Jesus. Now there was no one to whom she could confide her hopes and fears. The past two months had been very sorrowful. She had been parted from Jesus, in whose sympathy she found comfort. She pondered upon the words of Simeon, A sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. She recalled the three days of agony, when she thought Jesus lost to her forever, and with an anxious heart, she awaited his return. At the marriage feast, she meets him, the same tender, dutiful son. Yet, he is not the same. His countenance is changed. It bears the traces of his conflict in the wilderness, and a new expression of dignity and power gives evidence of his heavenly mission. With him is a group of young men whose eyes follow him with reverence and who call him Master. These companions recount to Mary what they have seen and heard at the baptism and elsewhere. They conclude by declaring, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. As the guests assemble, many seem to be preoccupied with some topic of absorbing interest. A suppressed excitement pervades the company. Little groups converse together in eager but quiet tones, and wondering glances are turned upon the son of Mary. As Mary had heard the disciples' testimony in regard to Jesus, she had been gladdened with the assurance that her long-cherished hopes were not in vain. Yet she would have been more than human if there had not mingled with this holy joy a trace of the fond mother's natural pride. As she saw the many glances bent upon Jesus, she longed to have him prove to the company that he was really the honored of God. She hoped there might be opportunity for him to work a miracle before them. It was the custom of the times for marriage festivities to continue several days. On this occasion, before the feast ended, it was found that the supply of wine had failed. This discovery caused much perplexity and regret. It was unusual to dispense with wine on festive occasions, and its absence would seem to indicate a want of hospitality. As a relative of the parties, Mary had assisted in the arrangements for the feast, and she now spoke to Jesus, saying, 
they have no wine. These words were a suggestion that he might supply their need. But Jesus answered, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. This answer, abrupt as it seems to us, expressed no coldness or discourtesy. The Saviour's form of address to his mother was in accordance with Oriental custom. It was used toward persons to whom it was desired to show respect. Every act of Christ's earthly life was in harmony with the precept he himself had given, Honour thy father and thy mother. On the cross, in his last act of tenderness toward his mother, Jesus again addressed her in the same way as he committed her to the care of his best-loved disciple. Both at the marriage feast and upon the cross, the love expressed in tone and look and manner interpreted his words. At his visit to the temple in his boyhood, as the mystery of his life opened before him, Christ had said to Mary, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? These words struck the keynote of his whole life and ministry. Everything was held in obeyance to his work, the great work of redemption which he had come into the world to accomplish. Now he repeated the lesson. There was danger that Mary would regard her relationship to Jesus as giving her a special claim upon him and the right, in some degree, to direct him in his mission. For thirty years he had been to her a loving and obedient son, and his love was unchanged, but he must now go about his father's work. As son of the Most High and Savior of the world, no earthly ties must hold him from his mission or influence his conduct. He must stand free to do the will of God. This lesson is also for us. The claims of God are paramount even to the ties of human relationship. No earthly attraction should turn our feet from the path in which He bids us walk. The only hope of redemption for our fallen race is in Christ. Mary could find salvation only through the Lamb of God. In herself, she possessed no merit. Her connection with Jesus placed her in no different spiritual relation to him from that of any other human soul. This is indicated in the Savior's words. He makes clear the distinction between his relation to her as the Son of Man and as the Son of God. The tie of kinship between them in no way placed her on an equality with him. The words, Mine hour is not yet come, point to the fact that every act of Christ's life on earth was in fulfillment of the plan that had existed from the days of eternity. Before he came to the earth, the plan lay out before him perfect in all its details. But as he walked among men, he was guided step by step by the Father's will. He did not hesitate to act at the appointed time. With the same submission, he waited until the time had come. In saying to Mary that his hour had not yet come, Jesus was replying to her unspoken thought, to the expectation she cherished in common with her people. She hoped that he would reveal himself as the Messiah and take the throne of Israel. But the time had not come not as a king, but as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief had Jesus accepted the lot of humanity. But though Mary had not a right conception of Christ's mission, she trusted him implicitly. To this faith, Jesus responded. It was to honor Mary's trust and to strengthen the faith of his disciples that the first miracle was performed. The disciples were to encounter many and great temptations to unbelief. To them, the prophecies had made it clear beyond all controversy that Jesus was the Messiah. 
they looked for the religious leaders to receive him with confidence even greater than their own. They declared among the people the wonderful works of Christ and their own confidence in his mission. But they were amazed and bitterly disappointed by the unbelief, the deep-seated prejudice and the enmity to Jesus displayed by the priests and rabbis. The Savior's early miracles strengthened the disciples to stand against this opposition. In no wise disconcerted by the words of Jesus, Mary said to those serving at table, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Thus she did what she could to prepare the way for the work of Christ. Beside the doorway stood six large stone water jars, and Jesus bade the servants fill these with water. It was done. Then, as the wine was wanted for immediate use, he said, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. Instead of the water with which the vessels had been filled, there flowed forth wine. Neither the ruler of the feast nor the guests generally were aware that the supply of wine had failed. Upon tasting that which the servants brought, the ruler found it superior to any he had ever before drunk and very different from that served at the beginning of the feast. Turning to the bridegroom, he said, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. As men set forth the best wine first, then afterward that which is worse, so does the world with its gifts. That which it offers may please the eye and fascinate the senses, but it proves to be unsatisfying. The wine turns to bitterness, the gaiety to gloom. That which was begun with songs and mirth ends in weariness and disgust. But the gifts of Jesus are ever fresh and new. The feast that he provides for the soul never fails to give satisfaction and joy. Each new gift increases the capacity of the receiver to appreciate and enjoy the blessings of the Lord. He gives grace for grace. There can be no failure of supply if you abide in Him. The fact that you receive a rich gift today ensures the reception of a richer gift tomorrow. The words of Jesus to Nathanael express the law of God's dealing with the children of faith. With every fresh revelation of his love, he declares to the receptive heart, Believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. The gift of Christ to the marriage feast was a symbol. The water represented baptism into his death, the wine the shedding of his blood for the sins of the world. The water to fill the jars was brought by human hands, but the word of Christ alone could impart to it life-giving virtue. So with the rites which point to the Saviour's death, it is only by the power of Christ, working through faith, that they have efficacy to nourish the soul. The word of Christ supplied ample provision for the feast. So abundant is the provision of His grace to blot out the iniquities of men and to renew and sustain the soul. At the first feast He attended with His disciples, Jesus gave them the cup that symbolized His work for their salvation. At the Last Supper He gave it again, in the institution of that sacred rite by which His death was to be shown forth till He come. And the sorrow of the disciples at parting from their Lord was comforted with the promise of reunion, as he said, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The wine which Christ provided for the feast and that which he gave to the disciples as a symbol of his own blood was the pure juice of the grape. To this the prophet Isaiah refers when he speaks of the new wine in the cluster and says, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. It was Christ who in the Old Testament gave the warning to Israel, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, 
and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And he himself provided no such beverage. Satan tempts men to indulgence that will becloud reason and benumb the spiritual perceptions. But Christ teaches us to bring the lower nature into subjection. His whole life was an example of self-denial. In order to break the power of appetite, he suffered in our behalf the severest test that humanity could endure. It was Christ who directed that John the Baptist should drink neither wine nor strong drink. It was he who enjoined similar abstinence upon the wife of Manoah, And he pronounced a curse upon the man who should put the bottle to his neighbor's lips. Christ did not contradict his own teaching. The unfermented wine which he provided for the wedding guests was a wholesome and refreshing drink. Its effect was to bring the taste into harmony with a healthful appetite. As the guests at the feast remarked upon the quality of the wine, inquiries were made that drew from the servants an account of the miracle. The company were for a time too much amazed to think of him who had performed the wonderful work. When at length they looked for him, it was found that he had withdrawn so quietly as to be unnoticed even by his disciples. The attention of the company was now turned to the disciples. For the first time they had the opportunity of acknowledging their faith in Jesus. They told what they had seen and heard at the Jordan, and there was kindled in many hearts the hope that God had raised up a deliverer for his people. The news of the miracle spread through all that region and was carried to Jerusalem. With new interest, the priests and elders searched the prophecies pointing to Christ's coming. There was eager desire to learn the mission of this new teacher who appeared among the people in so unassuming a manner. The ministry of Christ was in marked contrast to that of the Jewish elders. Their regard for tradition and formalism had destroyed all real freedom of thought or action. They lived in continual dread of defilement. To avoid contact with the unclean, they kept aloof, not only from the Gentiles, but from the majority of their own people, seeking neither to benefit them nor to win their friendship. By dwelling constantly on these matters, they had dwarfed their minds and narrowed the orbit of their lives. Their example encouraged egotism and intolerance among all classes of the people. Jesus began the work of reformation by coming into close sympathy with humanity. While he showed the greatest reverence for the law of God, he rebuked the pretentious piety of the Pharisees and tried to free the people from the senseless rules that bound them. He was seeking to break down the barriers which separated the different classes of society that he might bring men together as children of one family. His attendance at the marriage feast was designed to be a step toward effecting this. God had directed John the Baptist to dwell in the wilderness that he might be secluded from the influence of the priests and rabbis and be prepared for a special mission. But the austerity and isolation of his life were not an example for the people. John himself had not directed his hearers to forsake their former duties. He bade them give evidence of their repentance by faithfulness to God in the place where he had called them. Jesus reproved self-indulgence in all its forms, yet he was social in his nature. He accepted the hospitality of all classes, visiting the homes of the rich and the poor, the learned and the ignorant and seeking to elevate their thoughts from questions of commonplace life to those things that are spiritual and eternal. He gave no license to dissipation, and no shadow of worldly levity marred his conduct. Yet he found pleasure in scenes of innocent happiness, and by his presence sanctioned the social gathering. A Jewish marriage was an impressive occasion, and its joy was not displeasing to the Son of Man. 
By attending this feast, Jesus honored marriage as a divine institution. In both the Old and the New Testament, the marriage relation is employed to represent the tender and sacred union that exists between Christ and His people. To the mind of Jesus, the gladness of the wedding festivities pointed forward to the rejoicing of that day when He shall bring home His bride to the Father's house, and the redeemed with the Redeemer shall sit down to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He says, As the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, but thou shalt be called my delight, for the Lord delighteth in thee. He will rejoice over thee with joy, he will rest in his love, he will joy over thee with singing. When the vision of heavenly things was granted to John the Apostle, he wrote, I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him. For the marriage supper of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus saw in every soul one to whom must be given the call to his kingdom. He reached the hearts of the people by going among them as one who desired their good. He sought them in the public streets, in private houses, on the boats, in the synagogue, by the shores of the lake, and at the marriage feast. He met them at their daily vocations and manifested an interest in their secular affairs. He carried his instruction into the household, bringing families in their own homes under the influence of his divine presence. His strong personal sympathy helped to win hearts. He often repaired to the mountains for solitary prayer, but this was a preparation for his labor among men in active life. From these seasons he came forth to relieve the sick, to instruct the ignorant, and to break the chains from the captives of Satan. It was by personal contact and association that Jesus trained his disciples. Sometimes he taught them sitting among them on the mountainside, sometimes beside the sea or walking with them by the way. He revealed the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He did not sermonize as men do today. Wherever hearts were open to receive the divine message, he unfolded the truths of the way of salvation. He did not command his disciples to do this or that, but said, Follow me. On his journeys through country and cities, he took them with him, that they might see how he taught the people. He linked their interest with his, and they united with him in the work. The example of Christ in linking himself with the interests of humanity should be followed by all who preach his word and by all who have received the gospel of his grace. We are not to renounce social communion. We should not seclude ourselves from others. In order to reach all classes, we must meet them where they are. They will seldom seek us of their own accord. Not alone from the pulpit are the hearts of men touched by divine truth. There is another field of labor, humbler it may be, but fully as promising. It is found in the home of the lowly and in the mansion of the great, at the hospital board and in the gatherings for innocent social enjoyment. As disciples of Christ, we shall not mingle with the world from a mere love of pleasure to unite with them in folly. Such associations can result only in harm. We should never give sanction to sin by our words or our deeds, our silence or our presence. Wherever we go, we are to carry Jesus with us and to reveal to others the preciousness of our Saviour. But those who try to preserve their religion by hiding it within stone walls lose precious opportunities of doing good. Through the social relations, Christianity comes in contact with the world. Everyone 
who has received the divine illumination is to brighten the pathway of those who know not the light of life. We should all become witnesses for Jesus. Social power sanctified by the grace of Christ must be improved in winning souls to the Savior. Let the world see that we are not selfishly absorbed in our own interests, but that we desire others to share our blessings and privileges. Let them see that our religion does not make us unsympathetic or exacting. Let all who profess to have found Christ minister as he did for the benefit of men. We should never give to the world the false impression that Christians are a gloomy, unhappy people. If our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we shall see a compassionate Redeemer and shall catch light from his countenance. Wherever His Spirit reigns, there peace abides, and there will be joy also, for there is a calm, holy trust in God. Christ is pleased with His followers when they show that, though human, they are partakers of the divine nature. They are not statues, but living men and women. Their hearts refreshed by the dews of divine grace open and expand to the sun of righteousness. The light that shines upon them, they reflect upon others in works that are luminous with the love of Christ.